Thank you, uh, Professor Evans, for that kind introduction. You know, I actually spent a good few years of my youth uh, here when I was a graduate student. Uh, I mean, this was, I mean, not as long ago as at, uh, his PhD, but uh, already, already got, uh, approaching 30 years. Uh, I haven't uh, been back uh, for a while. I hope that the kitchen has improved uh, the lives of uh, vegetarians who, in my days, were sadly served only three dishes in rotation, not roast, cauliflower cheese, and margarita pizza, as far as I can remember. OK, I have been asked to uh, give a relatively unusual address uh, for a research uh, gathering because uh, you know, I have written a lot for the general public, books, you know, newspaper articles, you know, magazine articles, uh, blogs in website, and so on. And yeah, I mean, uh, the organizers that uh, asked me whether I could talk about that uh, experience, which uh, that is not easy to uh, hear about. So first of all, <laughs> Why do we write for the general public? You know, writing for the general public probably gets you a negative point for your academic assessment. I mean, these days uh, the university says we are going to look at the impact and so on. And I was one of the impact studies in the last uh, ref. I mean, I don't know that, that what impact uh, that had on the university's uh, standing. But it certainly didn't have uh, any uh, the positive effect on me. Yeah? But I think it is the duty of at least some academics to write for the general public. I'm not saying that everyone can or should do it. You know, I mean, there, there should be people whose stuff is so esoteric that people, uh, the general public, doesn't want to hear about it. Yeah? So I'm not saying that everyone should be engaged in this, but uh, you know, I think uh, more people can and should do it than it is currently done and uh, than uh, what people think is possible. Hmm? So first of all, I think uh, that by writing for the general public, you enrich other people's lives by letting them know about interesting developments in your field. Hmm? I mean, I have very poor background in science, but I read, I mean, enjoy uh, reading uh, science articles in newspapers and learn certainly a lot uh, uh, from those. Also, you, by doing this, uh, get to participate in public policy debates uh, related to your field. And you know there are very few fields that, uh, which are not kind of uh, related to public policy issues. And finally, you also have a self-interest in promoting your ideas if you are doing research that may have relevance beyond the academia. You know, somewhere I read that the average number of readers for an academic article in economics journals is five. And my student Sam told me that the median value is zero. Yeah? So basically, you're writing things uh, that virtually no one will read other than your PhD student. No, I'm not saying that that's uh, worthless, but uh, you, know, that, uh, you have to uh, realize that uh, writing for the general public can increase uh, the impact of uh, what you do hugely. Eh? Now, of course, uh, the challenge is how you do that. I mean, as uh, the title of the talk uh, that goes, uh, that it is because uh, that it's uh, not easy to be simple without being simplistic. So people say, oh, you know, that trying to write uh, for the general public, you have to simplify the argument and you, know, you, you kind of leave out so many things that, that uh, it can be misleading and limited. Well, I don't agree with that because most academic ideas, especially in social sciences, can be presented in an accessible manner if you try. And if you try, but your readers uh, 
do not understand, it is your fault, not theirs. Eh? Because the reading public is not stupid. Eh? Of course, reaching the general public will require some simplification. Eh? I'm not denying that, but that should not mean having to become simplistic. Because you can usually convey the key elements of an argument without giving all the technical details. Eh? This is possible. Eh? Sometimes it's not possible, but then you can always use analogies and examples to get the essential points across. Eh? Sometimes uh, it actually gives you a broader ability to discuss more fundamental issues more easily. Eh? Because when you drop the technicalities, then these are the more fundamental issues of ethics and politics and you know, cultural values and uh, these things come up. Yeah? yeah, so that a good example is uh, this debate on Brexit. You know, I mean, the economists uh, gave you, I mean, so many numbers. Yeah? You felt you were like drowning in numbers. Yeah? And then when people voted in the way that they didn't expect, they started criticizing people for being stupid. Yeah? Well, I say that uh, they are the stupid ones. Yeah? No, that, uh, because they should have understood that, that this is uh, not just about you know, having you know, 50 pounds more per week at, uh, in the next at, uh, six years. It's about identity, you know, it's about yeah, uh, values. Yeah? I'm not siding it any of the two parties, you know, I'm not even a British uh, citizen, so, you know, but they should have uh, understood that. Yeah? But sometimes if you are too involved in technicalities, you forget these uh, the bigger things. Yeah? I think it's uh, sometimes even better to drop the technicalities. Now, when you do that, I have a few tips. I say the opening story is very important. Yeah? This uh, story needs to be prominent enough not to require too much explanation, but needs to be directly relevant to your arguments. Because the problem is that, especially these days, there are literally tens of thousands of articles and dozens of books every day that is competing for attention. So how are you going to make uh, people read your stuff? You have to hook them in. And that uh, this means that you really need a good opening story. And getting a good opening story is uh, even more difficult when you are writing for the news media because the news media requires require that uh, your opening story is somehow linked to some current event, yeah? at most a few days old. Yeah, yeah so I mean, in my experience, uh, that. Uh, with uh, writing for newspapers, you know, I have uh, occasions like you know I write uh, something with an opening story, and they say the story is told. Yeah? Sometimes I that, that, that use some current event as a hook, and then they say so and so wrote an article starting with that story two days ago. We cannot print yours. Yeah? So you you have to that, that be very that, that uh, aware of this, and you know personally I have found this aspect the most difficult, yeah? writing for news media and uh, finding the right opening story. Yeah? Because, you know, of course, uh, sometimes you write a piece in reaction to something. Yeah, yeah then the opening story is obvious. Yeah? But sometimes you have a kind of regular column. Yeah? And then you have to find a reasonably current opening story. You know, sometimes there are six stories that you could use. Sometimes there's none. Yeah? I mean, that's the nature of uh, the uh, uh, human society. You know, that uh, one day, I mean, there, there, there are six uh, mega events. For two weeks, there's uh, nothing of note. Yeah? Anyway, so the, uh, this uh, problem with the opening story that is uh, something that I want to flag. And the second tip is that very often the most effective way of opening the reader's mind to your argument is to start by challenging some widely received conventional wisdom. 
So, well, some of my students have heard these stories. You know, French fries are not from France, they are from Belgium. Panama has are not made in Panama, they are from Ecuador. And the cuckoo clock wasn't invented in Switzerland. It was invented in Germany. Some years ago, I raised uh, quite a few eyebrows uh, when I was writing for one of the Korean newspapers. I even forget uh, what the main argument was, but I wanted to tell the Korean readers that you have to realize that you guys also have a lot of self-contradiction. Yeah? You know, when we were in school, we were drilled uh, this idea into our brain that Koreans are peace-loving people. Yeah? We've never invaded anyone, you know? and yeah, we, we were usually the, 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 on the other end of invasion. Yeah? So the, the, well, one of our school textbooks, uh, the history textbooks, uh, started with this uh, the thing saying, you know, in the last 2,000 something years of uh, known history, we have been invaded uh, some ridiculous number, like 1,475 times, you know, almost once a year, yeah? and then. Yeah, it went on, but we are still here. Yeah? We are great people. Yeah? But then in this article, I started by saying, yeah, this is the self-image of Koreans. But then how do you explain that one of our old kings was literally called he who expanded the territory? <laughs> if he didn't invade anyone, how do you expand territory yeah? in the 8th century, you know, the, sorry, the 7th century? Another, you know, the, the interesting facts uh, might be that the Netherlands, despite having one of the highest population densities in the world and very little land, is the third largest exporter of agricultural products. Eh? Because they have basically industrialized agriculture. Another interesting thing about uh, the <coughs> Greece that uh, you probably didn't know is that, you know, despite all this uh, German protestation that Greeks are in trouble because they are lazy, Greeks are actually the hardest working people in the Europe. They have the longest working hours at, at, uh, per year in Europe. They work 30% uh, longer than the Germans and 40% longer than the Dutch, who are officially the laziest people in the world. They have the shortest working hour in the world. No, no I'm not, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not criticizing them, you know, that I like it, you know, why should you work all the time like the Koreans? Eh? But then you'll be surprised to learn that Koreans who used to be the hardest working people in the OECD, this is a club of rich or richer countries are based in Paris, Koreans are have uh, the passed on the throne to the Mexicans, you know, especially if you are from North America. You know, the Mexicans lazy. Huh? That's uh, the uh, sort of uh, equation. Huh? No, actually, Mexicans have the longest working hour in the OECD. Yeah? They work twenty five percent longer than the uh, Americans. Huh? So who is the lazy one? Huh? Anyway, you know, I, mean, I just uh, wanted to make it a bit uh, light hearted. So I've given you all these examples, but sometimes when you break uh, people's uh, kind of uh, uh, conventional wisdom, they become a lot more open to yeah, the following argument. I, mean, I gave you that uh, story about the Korean king because I remember receiving so many emails about that article simply because I was able to open people's mind. Yeah? Because that story is so shocking. Yeah? I mean, it completely destroyed our self-image. Yeah? And probably all these people knew about this king. Yeah? And he was literally called the guy who expanded territory. Yeah? And no one saw that. Yeah? Well, finally, don't trust yourself too much. You know, many academics tend to see their writings as almost physical extensions of themselves and are very resistant to suggestions for changes and cuts. Yeah? However, it is important to recognize that while you may be the world's greatest expert on the matter you are writing about, although usually you are not, the editors and your literary agents, if you are trying to publish a book, know far much more about writing itself than you do. So my view is that uh, 
if they have a problem, you have to accept that few others will understand what you're writing. Yeah? Because uh, these guys are well-educated, well-read, you know, many of them have PhDs, you know. And if they say, well, this isn't quite coming across, then you have to accept that you are the one who has, uh, have a problem. Yeah? So I say a oh, general rule of, uh, good rule of thumb is that 90% of the time, you are wrong. Yeah? Yeah, sometimes uh, they are wrong, yeah? but you know, 90% of the time uh, you are wrong. So you have to accept their suggestions unless you are 120% sure that they are wrong. Yeah? Well, basically, you know, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that your academic research doesn't entitle you to be the best communicator of uh, your ideas. Yeah? Other people might be, if they understand it, might be actually better able to you know, communicate those messages and you have to accept that you know, people like these editors you know, in newspapers, in publishers, they know a lot more about you know, how to do that than you do. Anyway, so uh, let me uh, 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 finish there. I mean, I uh, hope uh, this uh, somewhat unusual but uh, the, the lighthearted talk uh, has uh, kind of uh, liven your interest in doing research and communicating the results, not just with the narrow you know, group of academics that are uh, in your field, but with uh, the general public, because uh, a lot of things you do, I mean, I was looking through the program, I mean, that most of uh, the, the research that uh, you guys are doing, I mean, that will have very eager you know, listeners uh, among the general public, and they'll have uh, very important implications for uh, public policies. And I hope that uh, my talk has uh, the reminded you of the need to communicate with the uh, bigger audience. Thank you very much. Question was, uh, why is it so difficult to make people understand the economy. Well, uh, I think uh, one reason is that economics uh, that really deals with things that you are familiar with, but then deal with it in particular ways. Uh, so people have this uh, commonsensical not, uh, understanding of certain things which come from their life experience. But then when economists talk about something, it might actually mean something slightly different from what the word is uh, that they uh, usually supposed to mean. Sometimes uh, that your personal experience cannot be extended uh, too far. So for example, that uh, one thing that you uh, mentioned is uh, this idea of the economy as a household. So the, all these worries about the, the, the public debt and so on, and uh, the idea is, well, that, uh, you know, what if uh, that we go bankrupt uh, kind of uh, worry. And yes, I mean, countries have gone bankrupt, but uh, you know, the, the way the national economy works is uh, the very different from how, the, the, the way a household works. Yeah? So in the household, if your income falls, there's no alternative than cutting spending. But in the national economy, when you try to do that, you have to remember that your spending is someone else's income. So if uh, enough people cut their spending because you know, the times are getting hard or their expectation for future has uh, deteriorated or for whatever reason, if uh, enough people cut spending, then enough people will lose their income and then they will uh, have to cut spending and so on and you can get into a down spiral. So the, you know, in this uh, particular area, People's understanding of uh, personal finance, which they often apply to understanding national economy, is actually wrong. This was uh, the, I mean, one of the key insights of uh, the great Cambridge economist uh, John Maynard Keynes. But I think that, that, that I mean, apart from those uh, few things that, that, that where uh, the people uh, project uh, their personal experience uh, to the bigger aspects of the economy in a way that they shouldn't, very often the confusion also 
comes uh, from the fact that it's so bound up with your everyday experience that you think you understand uh, what they are saying, but you actually don't because that, that, that they have very particular definition of what output is, what income is, what unemployment is, you know, for example, if you want to be counted that uh, officially as uh, the unemployed in these statistics, you should prove that you have been uh, looking for job for the last uh, four weeks. Because that, that only then you will be counted as being willing to work. But that, uh, you know, when times are really hard, like in 2008, 9, 10, 11, you know, a lot of people gave up on that, uh, looking for jobs because they have uh, made 200, 300 applications and got rejected for everything. Okay. So thank you for that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.